introduction. Um, my name is Ella Podmore and I work for the supercar company called McLaren Automotive. Now I am a materials engineer by trade and we're going to talk a little bit about what that involves later on. But what firstly does McLaren Automotive do? So I've got some images up here of what kind of cars we're creating and our passion on what the product wants, what we want the product to be, is all about customer experience. So you'll see the cars that we have here today. These are not the type of cars that you would go to the supermarket in, for example. This is all about how the customer feels on the track. And that's really important to bear in mind when we're going to talk about what kind of things I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So these cars are absolutely minimal. They're very, very lightweight. The lighter the car goes, the better our power to weight ratio is. Therefore, the faster our car travels. And generally, the faster our car goes, the happier the customer is. Now, the kind of cars that we sell at the moment, we have got three different series. And these are all indicated by the pictures on the screen now. So in the far left column, we're talking sports series. And these are our lightest cars these are our cheapest cars they retail at about 180 to 190 thousand pounds um, and they're the entry market into our kind of our customer base middle cars are the super series these are slightly more powerful these are slightly more expensive and they add an element of luxury and look into the aesthetic but the really exciting cars are the far right column. And these are called the ultimate series cars. And these are the best ones for me to work with because they are using the most elaborate materials possible. The bottom right image shows an, a car called the Speedtail, and this retails at 2.1 million pounds. And the, the badge on that alone, the front a uh, McLaren badge on that is worth about £10,000. And that's a really exciting project for me to work on. So next, we're going to have a little, little look around the car. So this is a 675 LT, and this is one of the sports series that we brought out a few years ago. And what I want to show you is how minimal our design is. So look, everything that you're seeing on the car there is for a purpose. There is no additional elements um, to try and make it more luxurious. Everything is bare bones because we want it to be lightweight as possible. So all the different types of components that you're seeing on the car is stuff that I've had my hands on. So we're talking, those exhaust finishes made from high grade aerospace titanium, all the different exterior components we're going to talk about, all to get that speed on the track, which what we see now. And this is where I work. So this is the office. It's based in Woking, Surrey, just south of London. And it is very James Bond. So what I get to walk around, um, the top right image is the kind of boulevard where we show off to our customers all the different historic cars that McLaren have competed in. In the top left image, that is the production facility. Now that is where I do all of my day-to-day -day working on the vehicle, looking around new vehicles to see if they're adequate, see if they're going to roll off the production line in a fit state for the customers. And then the bottom left image, that is an aerial view of the whole McLaren HQ. So the boulevard that you're seeing is the yin yang building on the right and the production center is that rectangular building on the left. So as you can see, everything's all on one site, which is very, very rare when it comes to automotive manufacturers, because it means that I can ask an engineer about a particular problem and go and view it on the car the same day. And the likes of BMW, Porsche, these facilities are a lot bigger than what we have at McLaren. And quite often you don't get to see the product. So that's a fantastic point to mention um, for McLaren. So materials engineer, what do I do as a materials engineer? I studied at school, I absolutely loved science. And when I went to secondary school, I studied chemistry, physics, maths, and IT. Now chemistry was all about the science of the, the molecules, the atoms, and that's what I absolutely loved. And I wanted to fix problems. I wanted to solve problems. I knew I wanted to be an engineer and contribute to industry. However, I was very nervous about applying chemistry to that because I thought it was just about physics or learning moments or learning the mechanics of it when 
actually that is not the case. So my love for chemistry developed into materials engineering, and that's what I went to study at university. And what my job involves at McLaren is looking at all the different types of materials that make up the car. So when we are testing new cars and we're in the development phase of bringing out a new model, there are lots of different components on the cars that have to go through a life cycle. We have to put them through. So if we're introducing a new, um, a new engine block, for example, that's an aluminium casting, and we have to put it through its paces to make sure that that is going to withstand a customer life cycle on the car. So we will drive it around the track multiple times, absolutely putting it through its paces of maximum performance. And then I would take that back to the lab and analyze it. And what you're seeing in the bottom right image there is an example of one of the microscopes that I would use to look at this aluminum casting, to look for any defects, to look for any cracks, um, and to look to see if the material has performed. So I spend about 50% of my time in the laboratory working on experiments, on analyzing these broken components from the test track, but also introducing new material technology onto our next cars. And that's really important that I get the balance of the two. And then the other 50% of my time is spent in boardrooms leading technical reviews. So as a materials engineer, there's only one of me at the company, yet in McLaren, there are many, many mechanical engineers, automotive engineers, and it's my job to make sure that all those people who are designing those components are talking together and working together using the appropriate materials. And so 50% of my time is talking to those lot, showing my reports and showing what I've found in the lab. So like I was much discussing, there is way, there are so many engineers at McLaren. It's really important to get your head around how many people are coming together. Now, for me, this is quite a good diagram because it's, an, it's called an exploded diagram and it represents what each component does in the car. So if you think behind every one of those tiny little bits, there's a team of engineers behind that. And then it is so important that we all come together and contribute on the likes of material choices, material specifications to that end goal. And a key component I'm going to point out here, um, which we can see is right in the middle. And what you're seeing is called a tub and it's a carbon fiber tub. So that word carbon fiber is a really important material to McLaren. We were the first companies to bring that type of material to the roads. We acquired it from aerospace. We acquired it from our sister company, McLaren Formula One, and we introduced it to the roads in the likes of the F1 road car. So without further ado, let's talk about the materials that make up McLaren. So we just discussed the carbon fiber tub, and there's an image of that in the top left there. And that is the heart of every car that we produce. So everything is attached onto the carbon fiber tub. And the unique benefit of using carbon fiber is that it's very strong, very rigid, but also it's incredibly lightweight. And like that main objective that I was talking about earlier, lightweight is what we want. We want to take as much mass out of the car as possible. So that is what everything attaches onto. When we look into the interior of the car, I'm using lots of different types of textiles and fabrics. And my job involves testing these particular types of fabrics to ensure that they have good chemical resistance. So the kind of chemicals that are involved inside the cabin, as we call it, um, on the interior of the car are the likes of orange juice, sun cream, tomato ketchup. These are household chemicals that are actually really corrosive and they can attack fabrics to a greater extent than maybe water or salt does, for example. So it's my job as a materials engineer in the fault analysis department to ensure that the bright pink leather that a customer may choose, for example, can withstand tomato ketchup. Or we look at things like different climates. So when we're introducing new cars into the likes of Russia, Dubai, Nevada, all these really extreme environments, we have really 
um, large amounts of UV in Dubai, for example, and quite a lot of our customers choose quite elaborate colors, colors in Dubai. So the likes of lime green or really fluorescent colors may degrade quicker under the UV exposure that we get in there. And that's a really important part of my job to make sure that the customization of what customers have picked to put on all their vehicles because they can pick any color or any fabric they want. It is my job to ensure that that kind of choice is adequate to our production spec. And a great example of this that I love to, um, I love to talk about is that quite often our customers pick 24 karat gold. Now you can see in the, the middle image in the bottom there, this is a 24 karat gold covered wheel alloy. Now, quite often we get asked to stitch 24 karat gold. We talked about the speed tail, you had a McLaren badge and platinum gold. And this is a really tricky material to put on a car. As you can imagine, it's very expensive. So you only get it in really, really thin applications, almost in a foil. And it is my job to make sure that wherever we put it on the car, so if you think about the conditions that a, a wheel goes through, you've got water from the roads, you've got, lots of aerodynamic pressure, you've got temperature changes, salt from the roads, grit, stone chips, and it's my job to make sure that that 24 karat gold is durable and is adequate to that production spec. So quite often I put lots of clear coated um, protection materials over the top of the gold to hold that in place and to make sure that it's not the gold that we're damaging. Another important bit to mention on our cars as well. Of course, we get to work with elaborate materials, luxurious leather, um, platinum golds, carbon fiber is not cheap as well, but we also use a lot of plastics. Now, if you think about all the different types of um, substances around you that are made from plastics, you can pick one up and realize how lightweight plastic is. And it's really important for people to understand that Plastics are also involved in our cars. And even though our cars may retail at two million pounds, there are some really high performance plastics that we use in our crumple zones, for example. And I've got an image of a, a rear bumper in the bottom left there. Crumple zones have to absorb energy. So if you were to have a car and it was to experience a crash, you want that car to absorb all the energy so that the um, pedestrians or the drivers in the car is not absorbing that energy and injuring themselves. So we want something to completely fragment, absorb it all into that material. And plastics is a really good material to do that. So that entire rear bumper in the back there is made from a high performance plastic. But of course, with our cars, our cars run very, very hot because they go very, very fast. And so there is some really clever material science going on in that rear bumper to ensure that when it sits around those exhaust tips and those exhaust tips can get to 600 or 700 degrees centigrade to make sure that that plastic doesn't melt. And that these are all the types of things that I'm doing in the lab. There are loads of other materials associated with these cars, but I wanted to point out these main few. And the last image we're going to talk about there is, of course, around the engine bay. And again, this gets extremely hot. It has to be consistent with the aesthetic of the car. And we're looking at additional carbon fiber, additional aluminium castings, magnesium castings. You may have heard magnesium being a different type of metal, very lightweight in comparison to aluminium as well. So these are some fantastic materials that I work with. In the lab, majority of my time is spent, but then I also present them in business meetings as well. I wanted to rush through that as quickly as possible because I appreciate we probably have quite a few questions. So if I can open it up to the floor as to what kind of questions we have. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. Ella, that was really interesting. No worries. So we have loads of questions. <laughs> so- <laughs> I can um, see them flying in. <laughs> yeah. So one that I found interesting was Dunkerton, and he asked, what country do you build the cars in? So we build them all in uh, McLaren HQ in Woking. So all the cars you see, all the McLaren cars you see in the world are built in the UK in Surrey. Okay. And Batson also asked, why did you become an engineer? That's a very good question. I became an engineer because I wanted to fix problems. I wanted to have a job that allowed me to 
create solutions and contribute to something really uh, big. I wanted to be part of an industry. I wanted to be that cog to contribute to um, a fantastic product. And when I was at school, I really, really enjoyed maths and chemistry. I loved the logical aspect of it. I loved uh, the idea that I can have one answer and I love working out problems like that. So once I established I like maths and chemistry and I established I wanted to fix things, that kind of led me down two routes of engineering types. And that was chemical engineering and materials engineering. And I soon discovered that the materials engineering degree course at Manchester was the best in the world. I'm biased. Um, so I went off to study that. <laughs> uh, I did see, I can't, I can't, I can't find the question um, or who asked it, but why did you choose um, uh, McLaren? Or why have you always been interested in cars? Yes, that's another good question. I grew up with a picture of the McLaren P1 on my bedroom wall. So that was my absolute dream car. Um, I liked cars growing up. I liked Top Gear, I watched that kind of thing, but I was never interested in fixing the cars. Like I didn't want to get my hands dirty or I didn't want to be in a boiler suit. I just, I liked the logical um, understanding of how things fitted together, but I never wanted to be like a technician or I never wanted to work in the garage. Um, so that combined with my logical thought process and when I studied materials engineering I thought how can I apply this to something that I absolutely have been dreaming of for ages and I thought you know what I'd love to work at McLaren because that was my favorite car and at the time McLaren didn't have materials engineers they only employed mechanical and automotive engineers so long story short I wrote them a letter sent off my CV and they created a department for me off the back of my university degree. And uh, yeah, three years later, materials engineer, I'm still here. And it, it appears I'm quite useful. So they're going to hang on to me for a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> so you made your own career, basically. Yes, exactly. The possibilities are endless, guys. <laughs> Write those letters. <laughs> um, so what kind of skills outside of the classroom do you think are, are beneficial for you? for people to enter, enter engineering? That's a really good question. Now, when you're in school, it all becomes about grades. And if you know that you want to solve problems, you want to be an engineer, um, there's a lot of pressure for you to think, right, I've got to do really well at my schoolwork. But the best skills, of course, you've got to keep your grades up. You've got to um, see what interests you in science to get through those, um, through the engineering pathways. But the best skills that I could have learned working at McLaren and the things that I always get asked about in interviews, it was the, um, the main thing that was picked up in my McLaren interview, for example. And these are the soft skills that you wouldn't necessarily associate with studying. And these are teamwork, leadership, communication. These skills are the kind of things that you're going to acquire through doing your hobbies, for example, or your extracurricular activities. Now, personally for me, I absolutely love sport and netball was my thing. Like I loved it. I did it all throughout primary school, secondary school as well. And then I went to Manchester University and I kept it going. And it's really important. I want to stress that no matter how stressed you are at school, no matter how many things you've got going on, I really want to enforce that you guys continue your hobbies because these are the way you're going to learn these soft skills. And when I went to Manchester University, I ran netball up there. So I was president of the netball society. And when I applied to McLaren, you know, sitting in this fancy office, like I showed you, all these men about so it's sort of very technical minded and they go, tell me about um, you running netball. What were all the problems that you faced in that? And I was like, what on earth are they asking <laughs> me about that for? But it was so important for them to understand about how I dealt with teams because that exploded diagram that we talked about, all those different individuals contributing to one car, it is so important that you understand people and it's so important that you can communicate to people who aren't in your field. So keep your hobbies going, whether it be sport, music, art, languages, um, the skills you learn from there are so valuable. Mm -hmm. And um, Cooper has asked, how long does it take to make a car? Ooh, 
So at McLaren, it's very different. McLaren, we are very fast paced. And this is probably going to shock some of you, but we can get a car out from pen to paper all the way through to the production phase and customer receiving a car in about seven months. Now, in the likes of Jaguar Land Rover, BMW, Mercedes, this takes absolute years. And the reason that we're able to manufacture it so quickly is, firstly, we don't produce that many. So we have very small numbers. They're very specialized. That's why they're so expensive. But also our deadlines are so quickly. So we have business programs that want to bring out uh, 30 cars by 2030 and these kind of things. Um, so the idea is, is that we're rolling them out very quickly and we're mixing it up in those different series. So sports, super and ultimate as well. So, yeah, very quick, but it's a high performance environment. You kind of have to be a particular type of person to love it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely handle the stress. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so Jennifer asked, what design does the world need right now? What design does the world need right now? Oh, Jennifer, that is a big question. I can only answer on behalf of the automotive industry. Now, I think a few of you are fully aware of the, the movement towards electric vehicles. Now, we've just recently brought out a hybrid vehicle, which means we have both an electric motor and a combustion engine in it. And we have two different modes in which our car can drive on. We can switch it to all electric or we can run off a combustion engine. Now with the movement towards electric vehicles yes we've got the likes of tesla in the states we've got a rival rivian in the uk there is going to be a big automotive boom in terms of electric vehicles and we are preparing ourselves for it but if i were to recommend any sort of design going forward it's to account for these really large battery packs so if you like cars and you want to work in the automotive industry you want to be an engineer on cars, um, make sure you brush up on what electric vehicles are because they are going to take the entire world by storm and we're gonna to have to design cars in a completely different way because these battery packs are very heavy. And in order for us to install them on the likes of powerful cars, supercars like McLarens, we're gonna to have to take that weight out somewhere else to account for it. So designing is all going to be about lightweight and uh, electric vehicles those are going to be my recommendations mm -hmm. and those are probably things that could be included in the if you're an engineer what could you do competition is maybe some inventions that people could come up with absolutely how to integrate those electric systems into cars but all transport maybe trains planes um and uh and yeah account for those battery packs yeah what was the most expensive car you have worked on this is asked by dylan Ooh, Dylan, you're just like me. I like to know what, what the worth of everything I'm working on. Like, <laughs> whose car is this going to? Um, so I have worked on Mr. Bean's car. Uh, Rowan Atkinson owns a McLaren F1, and it is one of the, the most expensive F1s that we did purely because of its association with the actor, but also um, the, the type of car that we worked on. That was probably around 10 million, but the, the most expensive car that I worked on was a renovated F1. And this is an old, old car that we sold probably, oh, I don't know, 12 years ago, 15 years ago now. And it is recently become the most expensive British supercar ever to be auctioned off. And it went for 19 million pounds. And that was the McLaren F1 road car, um, yeah. And I had to work in gloves and masks and glasses and everything. And they were very funny with what I touched, but it was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine for that money. Um, so kind of similar, what was the fastest car that you've worked on? And that was asked by Anonymous. Okay. The fastest car would be the Senna GTR. So that is a version of what we're seeing on this final slide here. Now you can see how aggressive this particular car looks. It's all about speed and it's all about how aerodynamics can hold that thing that's going so fast on the road. Um, it reaches speeds of what, 250 miles per hour. It's just super, super fast and that's its main objective. And anything that I do on that car has to be the ultimate lightweight 
you know, even the ways that we, you can see how much weight's taken out of the door, for example. And yeah, it's very, very fast, very <laughs> scary. I get to drive these cars and I've never driven one of them purely because I'm too frightened. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually one of the questions that I did have was, do you get to test any of the cars that you work on? Yeah, it's a question I get asked a lot. And as a materials engineer, you wouldn't expect me to drive these types of cars, but because I'm a materials engineer in the fault analysis team, it's very important for me to gain an understanding of what faults are coming up on upcoming models. So we, when the Senna was in pre-production, so before customers got hold of this car, we had to make sure that it was going around the track right. And I had to make sure that the materials, they weren't squeaking in the interior or they weren't rattling and nothing was rubbing, catching fire, anything like this. Um, and in order for me to do that, I have to sit in the passenger seat or I have to drive them myself. And uh, another question I always get is what's your favorite car? Like I said, I haven't driven the Senna GTR, but it's dubbed to be like absolute monster on the road and terrifying, but every petrol head stream. For me, the 765 LT, which is part of the sports series, no, super series, sorry, um, is a fun little compact track car. And it is just, it's a dream. It's so much fun. It's just like a little go-kart that you get to go proper fast in. So yeah. that's my favorite. Um, so this isn't just from one person. I've seen it, you know, asked a few times, but have you ever been, you know, treated unfairly being a woman in engineering? Because it is, there's still quite a, a vast gender imbalance within engineering. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's a really important topic. A lot of what I do is to raise awareness of getting girls, more importantly, into STEM subjects. Um, I will be honest, it's tough. As a materials engineer, when I studied at Manchester, the disparity, the, the gender imbalance was not bad. And I think there is a fantastic movement in universities, in schools. Um, I see significant improvement in terms of the, the, the balance in those studying subjects. However, I work for a supercar brand. Now, materials engineering is making great headway. I think the automotive industry has a long way to come. There's a huge masculine stigma associated with cars. There's a the huge um, testosterone aura around a supercar. And I think I had a chat about like how we market our cars. I'm trying to like establish how that comes about. But yeah, the, the greatest um, challenges I face being a woman and being the only woman in the room is from being part of the automotive industry. But like I said, I've been with the company probably about four years now. Um, and in those years, I've seen such improvement. So it's getting there. Um, but you know, it's tough. Don't let it, don't let it, uh, you know, get you down. Like I use it to motivate myself. So I, as soon as I joined the company, I was in a bit of a spotlight, but that made me motivate me and go on to do like really big things because I wanted to show up. I wanted to be like, yeah, actually I am the only woman in this team of 200 people, I think on one project. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, but then I shaved off X amount of kilos and everyone's like, oh my gosh, she's actually really good. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so let it motivate you. Don't let it dishearten you. Mm -hmm. Um, so you recently won the Young Woman Engineer of the Year Award. So what was that like? That was very validating, I suppose. Oh, thank you. This is very new. This <laughs> isn't sunk in yet. This happened last week. i um, in shock. Um, and it felt, it was like the best moment of my life. Um, I, the reason I feel so proud for it is because, of course, I've now got quite a big platform. So I really want to show all aspiring males, females wanting to get into STEM subjects, like the, the sheer variety of um, engineers. So I'm a materials engineer. I work on microscopes. Yes, I'm associated with this car brand, but like I work with atoms and that's awesome. Like it's really glamorous. It's really um rewarding and I want to like use that platform to broadcast all the amazing types of engineering that's out there in the UK but also I want to broadcast it for the automotive industry for the fantastic women in the automotive industry because there are a lot of girls in there and they're doing some amazing stuff so um yeah I'm completely overwhelmed and 
it's been really cool so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So we kind of running out of time, but I think I'll do a couple more questions if that's okay. Yeah, we've yeah, got, go for we've it. We've got over 200 questions, so. I'm actually, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so can you describe a problem that you solved that was the most satisfying? And that's from Claire. Ooh, great question, Claire. Um, okay, really quickly, I'll go back to the speed tail which is seen, I think on my first slide, um, speed tail was all about that aesthetic design. So the bottom right image we're looking there and you can see that really long um, rear wing, like it all goes into a point along the back there. Now this car goes up to 220, 230 miles per hour, but the designers wanted it to be completely flush, aesthetic and beautiful. It didn't want any of the aerodynamic features that we had on the center, which is the car directly above it. You can see that big, quite ugly rear wing, but very essential to keep the car on the ground. Now with the speed tail, we had to create 4,000 kilos worth of downforce, but we had to do that in a way that looked pretty. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, how are we gonna do this? And they said, right, we wanted a, a flexible wing. So one that lifted up when we needed it to create that downforce, but then one that disappeared away that um, when parked up and stuff, you had that aesthetic design. And we, we were able to do this by correct material selection. And that's using that carbon fiber, that magic material. Um, we were able to get the perfect amount of layer because carbon fiber is all about uh, applying loads of layers and putting it in a plastic matrix. Um, we were able to get the optimum thickness that allowed us to have the rigidity to keep that downforce, but then the, gave us the flexibility for it to retract back down again. And that was a huge win. That was the first time an automotive company has been able to do that. So world first, we were very elated by that. And I was proper gas to be associated with that kind of project. <laughs> My microscope images were shown all over the world for that. So yeah, very rewarding moment. But yeah, that's definitely not satisfying then. Yeah. Um, so second to last one, um how old were you when you became or how old were you when you wanted to become an engineer have you always always wanted to be um I was very fortunate that I knew what an engineer was at a very young age so probably 15 years old I knew that I liked science and I wanted to fix problems so I was like I think I really want to be an engineer and you know you have so many resources available to you guys now in terms of YouTube TEDx and Khan Academy like there are so many things where you can you can research things really quickly and you can find out what engineers do so from age 15 I knew I wanted to be an engineer and then only when I got to probably 17 18 that I realized actually materials engineering is what I wanted to do but do not let the choice come to you like you you've got to go out there and explore what you're passionate about and explore um, things that are going to get you interested in so make sure you have a look about quickly yeah and I suppose that kind of feeds into my final question which is do you have any advice for the for the young engineers watching today oh that's a good question to finish with um I would say to all the girls who are wanting to get into the industry absolutely go for it so quite often people say about role models in industry, um, and of course I want to use this platform to show like, I look like this, I'm an engineer and I still wear heels to work, like it's fantastic, you can be yourself and you can be an engineer. Um, but also to all the girls out there, don't worry if you can't see a role model um, or someone that relates to you in your industry, in your dream job, because I didn't have that. Um, my advice would be to absolutely go for it anyway. So I wrote a letter to McLaren thinking, this is quite funny. They're probably not going to read this at all. And I ended up creating a department for myself. So be brave, be yourself. Don't ever feel like you have to change yourself to fit a stereotype to be an engineer. Um, and yeah, just absolutely go for it. But also final point, um, to find your passion. So you're going to be doing this for you know, you want to be excited about your job. I go into my office every day and I am so excited and I get to work on some of the coolest cars and just fills me with absolute joy every day. And it's really important that you go and research what's going to give you that feeling because there are so many engineering jobs out there. You never have to limit yourself to being 
quite a lot of people think that mechanical engineering, like the traditional type of engineering is what I'm going to have to do if I want to be an engineer. Absolutely wrong. There's everything from bio tissue engineering, textiles, technology engineering, materials, chemical, automotive, like there's so many things out there. So make sure you do your research. Um, and it's a really good career to have. There are so many jobs out there, guys. So go for it. The possibilities are endless, really. <laughs> they are, yes. It's cliche, but they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you, everyone. That's all we've really got time for. We have run over slightly. Uh, we've had so many questions, so obviously we couldn't have gotten through them all, but thank you for sending them in. Um, and hopefully you've been inspired by Ella's career and her story. So if you want to find any, out anything else for the If You're an Engineer, What Would You Do competition, you can head to www.leadersaward.com and you can find lots of different resources on there and inspiration. So I'll end it there. Thank you, Ella. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye.